Good afternoon and welcome to World Oregon's webinar, Further Lessons from the Influenza Pandemic of 1918-1919 with uh, our special uh, friend and, and guest today, Christopher McKnight Nichols from Oregon State University. Uh, this is a special program done jointly with our friends and partners at the Oregon Historical Society and we welcome members of both the Oregon Historical Society and World Oregon. If you're not a member of either, encourage you to uh, join one or both uh, and to support uh, our work, uh, especially uh, during this challenging time of COVID-19. Uh, you can join on either of our websites. Uh, for those of you who haven't joined us before, I'm gonna go through a few uh, sort of public service announcements um, before I hand um, everything over to uh, Christopher. Um, we're very excited to be having this program um, and we'll dive into the substance here in just a minute. If you have not uh, been on a World Oregon webinar before, please um, note that all participants except for World Oregon staff and the presenter are muted with your video off. Um, you can, however, interact by um, posting comments in chat and asking questions in the Q&A. Uh, my colleague, Tim DeRoche, the Director of Programs, will be moderating the questions later after Christopher's uh, presentation. And we expect to have a lot of great uh, questions, so uh, get ready for those. Again, you can pose them in the Q&A function. We will be recording this um, presentation uh, for posterity, so we can post it on our uh, YouTube channel, and uh, Oregon Historical Society might do the same. So mind your P's and Q's in your questions. Um, and uh, at the end of the program, we will make mention of some of the upcoming uh, webinars we have going on. All right. And now I'm going to introduce our uh, speaker, again, who has uh, done several programs with us uh, and the Oregon Historical Society, and we're thrilled to have him back. We're not thrilled about the reason why um, the topic is so prescient, um, but we recognize it really is an important one. Looking back at what happened in the 1918-1919 pandemic and what's going on today with the COVID-19 pandemic. Christopher McKnight Nichols is an Associate Professor of History at Oregon State University, a close partner of World Oregon. And he directs the Center for Humanities and leads the Citizenship and Crisis of Initiative. He specializes in the history of the United States and its relationship to the rest of the world, with a focus on isolationism, internationalism, and globalism. Excuse me, globalization. Nichols is the author of Promise and Peril, America at the Dawn of a Global Age, and in 2016 was named one of 33 An Andrew Carnegie Fellows worldwide. He's also been elected a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And as we noted on the board of the Oregon Historical Society, our close partner, and we're thrilled to be partnering with OSU and the Oregon Historical Society. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to our presenter, Christopher. Thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here with you, uh, Derek. Thank you, uh, and Tim DeRoche. Thank you as well. And thanks to our um, the great uh, World Oregon team uh, and the Oregon Historical Society, who's also been uh, a fantastic uh, partner in in so many uh, collaborations. Uh, I really do wish we could be together in person. Um, this is the sort of uh, important historical relevant topic. Um, that it would be even better to be together in community discussing uh, in the same room. Uh, but we are uh, virtually together, remotely together here. Uh, so I can present uh, and we can talk and think together and hopefully I'll leave you with some thoughts um, that will be uh, insightful uh, and maybe generate some discussion and conversation at home uh, in the workplace and elsewhere. Uh, so um, without further ado, I will share my screen, uh, give a few caveats uh, and get going on what I hope will be a very engaging uh, program. So um, the first thing to note um, is that we're, we're reprising this conversation uh, about six months after the first time that I uh, did a talk on this subject uh, with the World Oregon team and uh, in partnership with the Oregon Historical Society. Uh, so this is further lessons from the influenza pandemic of 1918-19. Um, one of the things I want to note at first is that I'm a historian, a uh, historian of American foreign relations and politics, history of ideas, uh, and that I've worked extensively on the flu, uh, especially in the context of World War I, um, but I'm not uh, an epidemiologist, obviously. So uh, I'm giving you a historical and foreign relations perspective on the subject. Um, another uh, important uh, note, and I'll, at the end, I'll have some select references that you all can see. 
uh, we'll share uh, after the fact and in the video broadcast that will follow and be uploaded. Uh, you know, I'm relying on lots of great history. Some of this is my own interpretation and research and some comes from others and I've tried to attribute that um, as well as possible. So what I'll be doing today is we're going to take a big picture perspective and really look at exactly what's coming out right now about thinking about the US's response to COVID in 2020 in international comparison as, uh, as an individual nation uh, and then try to go back through the history to compare and contrast and draw out some further lessons. So we'll first start with some very relevant just emerging information and data, uh, some Pew Research Center polls, uh, some new analysis from Bro Brookings Institution to think about uh, the US's uh, response uh, in global perspective um, as we move through. So um, here's a first slide to get us going and thinking, you know, as anyone who's uh, involved in a World Oregon event, uh, World Affairs Council's Council on Foreign Relations knows, uh, we know that signals matter a lot in foreign relations and IR theory, signals at different levels in terms of networks and communications, um, signals matter. Uh, so if you think about wars, they send signals and threats of, of conflict, uh, but pandemics and public health also matter a lot. Actually, I have a forthcoming book project uh, on rethinking American grand strategy. And one of the really um, signature chapters in that volume, in my opinion, is on public health as grand strategy. If you look around the world today, um, other nations are, and individuals and citizens in those states, diplomats and politicians are looking at the US, they're looking at comparatively at other countries uh, and making assessments about which countries uh, did better or worse uh, in terms of dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and then also the other attendant problems that come with a pandemic, for instance, potential political polarization, uh, and of course, recession and depression. Um, and so as we look around the world today, and this is emerging information that's just coming out now, the Pew Research Center study uh, that I'm, I'm noting here just came out, um, U.S. favorability rankings and ratings have plummeted worldwide. Negative views of the pandemic have been uh, what uh, those doing this polling have suggested um, have really helped to tank uh, American favorability. Uh, we're at currently at lows that are akin to those of uh, the early Iraq war. Uh, tensions with countries like France, for instance, uh, the U.S. is now lower than um, uh, lower than uh, comparable moments in, in other eras. Uh, Germans especially give the U.S. low marks, and I think part of this is attributable to the to the conflict between uh, President Trump uh, and Angela Merkel, but it also um, underlies a deeper sense of the ways in which the U.S.'s response to the pandemic have been widely panned by the world community. Now, we could quibble with whether or not we agree with this assessment. Now, we could quibble with whether or not we care um, as scholars, as thinkers, as citizens, uh, wherever we are located in the world. Uh, but we can't, what we can't really contest is the fact that the U.S. is uh, pretty much uniformly seen as the worst performing uh, major country in the world uh, and arguably the worst performing country in the world, period, related to the pandemic. And partly that's because of the U.S.'s unique capacity. Just you know, in 2019, public health scholars around the world ranked the U.S. as best capable of dealing with a global pandemic. And so you know, that expectation has not been met. Uh, so this is an important way of thinking about the international um, dimensions of dealing with pandemics more broadly. Uh, and I want us to think about this moment in 2020 and then compare it back to 1918 as we go. Um, so here we're looking at all public surveyed, uh, ranking the US coronavirus response lowest. And here, interestingly, Spain has the highest view uh, and South Korea the lowest uh, at, at, at only 6% uh, saying the US has done a good job uh, and, and topping out at 20%. Uh, and then you can also see here other nations and groups that they think have done well, like the World Health Organization or the EU. Uh, and again, uh, there are some interesting uh, pieces here that we could tease out, uh, but it's, it's, it's most, the most important takeaway is the uniformly negative views that the world community seems to have about the US. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to signal here at the outset in thinking globally about further lessons from 1918 as they pertain to the present um, is to think about uh, this, uh, these signals that are being sent in the world community. So if, you, if you're thinking about um, what are the signals that the US sends uh, when it's confronted by threats, uh, for instance, you know, rising uh, questions of, of nuclear proliferation, you know, other programs that World Oregon has done and is doing uh, on, these, on these kinds of concerns, or climate change. Uh, the U.S., part of 
these new perspectives, what we're seeing now um, in fall 2020, uh, is that the world community sees the US as less effective in dealing with virtually every kind of uh, external uh, and internal threat to the nation state. Uh, and this is something um, that's worth uh, remarking on, particularly in the context of World War I, where of course the US was seen uh, in late 1918 and into early 1919 um, as, a, as a major important power helping to bring uh, what Woodrow Wilson called peace without victory, uh, a peace for small and large states. Now that we know how with historical hindsight that that did not play out, but the US was very positively be viewed from what we know anecdotally. We don't have good um, social science polling. Uh, in comparison, in this moment of pandemic, the pandemic response itself, but also other global issues, have helped to tank the US's approval ratings. Here's just a nice little breakdown of that. Poor marks for America's response to the coronavirus outbreak. And again, th these are this is information that's just coming out September 15th, September 16th. Uh, and that the World Health Organization, which the US has pulled out of, um, has, has been viewed more positively. Uh, seems significant that uh, China has, has been viewed more positively, at least than the US in its response, uh, seems significant, particularly with the political rhetoric coming out of the uh, White House uh, related to China's role in, in this. Uh, again, these, these are um, interesting pieces of data in and of themselves that they don't tell us the full story, but they're useful to start us out in thinking about the global dimensions of pandemics more broadly. Uh, economic decline is another piece of this. Uh, and I've, I've talked extensively in other talks, and we'll, we'll get to this a little bit, what happened to the economy in 1918 and 1919. Um, it, did, uh, it did decline um, in 1918 and 19. Uh, one takeaway from that pandemic that we see today is there's, what I argue is there's no such thing as business as usual in a pandemic. Um, workers, people uh, vote with their feet. Uh, they don't show up to work. Uh, they, they don't uh, purchase as many goods. Unemployment obviously um, becomes more rampant uh, in moments of pandemic as businesses shut or there are limits on the number of people who can come in. Uh, so as you, if you look here, you see you know, the US in the middle of the pack um, uh, on, uh, on, its, uh, on the decline in the second quarter, um, that's through the end of June. We'll be getting our third quarter uh, information at the end of September uh, when that quarter uh, ends. So reports are that that will be higher, but we're seeing 9.5% um, uh, uh, decline here uh, in second quarter um, GDP uh, relative to the same quarter in 2019. So again, the, as the world looks around at the US, as we look at ourselves here in the US, uh, thinking about where the nation uh, ranks in its response, in the economic decline, uh, in the federal and state policies that have led to that. Uh, here's some Brookings analysis that just came out yesterday from Harry Holzer. Uh, if we're looking at the US versus the other wealthy OECD countries, so the OECD was formed in 1961. It actually comes out of the Marshall Plan program that was formed in uh, uh, 1948. Uh, uh, first, uh, a grouping of major economies uh, in, in Europe and then around the world with 37 member nations, but now it's 25 richest. If you're measuring the US against those and you look here, uh, you can look at uh, unemployment rates uh, and and, and the U.S.'s uh, staggeringly higher unemployment rates uh, versus other wealthy uh, nations. Um, this is one thing that stands out in terms of the response and one reason why um, uh, foreign policy observers looking at the U.S. and the U.S.'s response to the pandemic uh, see problems, right, obviously. Um, a, another uh, very telling statistic, and I'm going to show some global perspectives in comparisons to 1918 shortly, uh, is differences in virus outcomes. Again, this is Harry Holzer, uh, Holzer's analysis in the Brookings Institution report that just came out yesterday, differences in virus outcomes. And, and here's another scenario, uh, another piece of data in which we um, get a better sense of how the US has done and fared poorly, new cases per thousand versus deaths and other countries. Uh, and again, you know, this is what, um, this is undergirding those uh, sensibilities about threats uh, and about uh, the pandemic response and favorability. Uh, but it's also telling of a moment, it's a snapshot of international relations. It tells us something about the US US's ability to handle its own business internally and then to project its capacity to do so abroad, uh, which, you know, to be perfectly honest, when you look at some of these pieces of data, um, really does support that unfavorable uh, view. Um, Again, here's another way of looking at this. Probably everybody here at this presentation ha has been looking at these numbers too. So I just want to visu help visualize them a bit. You know, here's the seven day rolling average of new confirmed cases. And again, the US is always at the top of these lists whenever you're drawing your data. I grabbed this yesterday, uh, you know, um, right up there at the top. 
number of confirmed cases uh, is all, always lower than the number of actual cases. This is very much a concern for us in thinking about the data from 1918 and 19. Um, we have uh, a very similar phenomenon today. Um, and as we roll through an, another way of looking at this, just looking at the US, you know, the question here, or what, you're, what you probably want to see here uh, is a flattening of the curve and a decline. And what we've seen uh, since the outbreak is that the US has remained at a relative plateau. So public health scholars who look at the data of 1918 and 19, um, insofar as we have good longitudinal data, see a lot of peaks and valleys. Uh, we see three waves. Uh, and this is what I'm going to emphasize as we move through the rest of our talk and think together about 1918 and 19. So let's talk about that going global. Let's compare the pandemics, 1918, 1920. Now, th this is some data from the middle of August, but it still pretty much holds. We're up to 196,000 deaths in the US, uh, 930 or so thousand um, tragic, tragic deaths around the world as well. Uh, but if you look at these and you compare the two, Right, the Spanish flu, so-called, and we don't we want to put that in quotes because um, that term uh, is, is generally thought of by scholars now um, as, as a problematic, uh, not least because the flu doesn't originate in Spain, but also because of its uh, racialized and politicized rhetorical moves, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. But in any case, you look here, you look at the Spanish flu's uh, so-called um, death rates. Uh, in the U.S., 675,000 people die uh, is our best estimate. We're, we're looking at roughly 50 million worldwide. Um, estimates vary uh, between 18 to 20 million and 100 million worldwide deaths, and there are some upper uh, end uh, deaths in the U.S., um, but 675 is generally what uh, we tend to uh, refer to. And you look at this and you see how much uh, more um, uh, deadly, how, how much more fatalities there were in, from the flu in 1918 um, worldwide uh, and in the US. Uh, and we will see how this plays out um, globally. Uh, let's hope uh, that remains true. Um, but as we think about what's so staggering, and again, these are the mid-August numbers, but, but they're, they hold true today. What's so staggering when you compare the two, and I just want to leave this up here for a moment and look at that. You know, influenza, roughly 50 million deaths, 1918 and 19, versus uh, COVID deaths. Uh, the U.S. as a percentage of world population. So here we see the U.S. as a percentage of world population in 1918 and 19, about 5.7%. Today it's about 1.4%. Uh, 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 today it's about 4.2%, uh, excuse me. If you look at the, the deaths from the flu, about 1.4% of the global deaths in 1918 and 19 came from the U.S. And this is the thing that's staggering for those of us who are historians of this period and compare the two on the order of 21, 22% of deaths worldwide have come from the US. And this is partly why uh, public health scholars in particular, when they look at the US response, rate it unfavorably today. Uh, and this is a staggering difference uh, because of course, as we just saw, that the mortality rates are so much lower, excuse me, the mortality rates are so much lower today from COVID overall. Uh, and so that the U.S. has suffered so much worse um, is uh, astonishing to those observers who've been thinking about and researching uh, the virulence of these kinds of viral pandemics. All right, so uh, now we've got our global perspective. We've got some comparisons. Let's think together for a little while about um, the flu uh, as it spread uh, and, and um, think about death rates and think about um, what happened in 1918 and 1919. And here's one more visualization and one more way to begin that conversation. So one thing that stands out is very different between today and then. And something we know a lot more about since the last time I gave a talk with World Oregon and Oregon Historical Society is uh, that the peoples and groups, uh, the demographic groups who are most affected. Uh, we know that today uh, the demographic groups that are most affected are in the older age cohort uh, and that so socioeconomic status and people of color, marginalized people uh, are, are like 1918, uh, disproportionately affected. Uh, the thing that stands out perhaps most when you look at what happened in 1918, why it was so devastating and why people were so fearful, was that it uh, disproportionately affected people in the 18 to 45 age bracket, roughly speaking. Something on the order of one half to two thirds of the total deaths in 1918 and 19. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people who died uh, were from that age bracket. Uh, the healthiest people in society were most affected. And that is not the case as far as we know today, thankfully. 
Uh, and so this is useful for us in thinking about that moment. We also know that the incubation rate is, is, is quite different. The influenza average incubation rate was something like two days and almost never more than four or five. Uh, whereas we know that coronavirus uh, is something like twice as long and they're more asymptomatic carriers. And so it's just a, a quite a different kind of a virus and quite a different way of thinking about incubation rate uh, and death uh, and contagion even. Um, so in short, uh, one of the things that historians like to emphasize when we think about this history and this moment is that all that data, everything that I just showed you, um, should be uh, taken with an important grain of salt. And that grain of salt uh, is something that we emphasized in, a, in an article that I recently published in the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And that is that suffering is the main way to understand, uh, is the prism through which we should understand and think about. Um, the history of the pandemic of 1918 and 19. Immense suffering. The vast majority of deaths came in the fall of 1918, the deadly second wave. Uh, and it absolutely astonished the American medical profession and devastated families. And again, in part because so many young, healthy people, doctors and nurses were disproportionately hit, uh, soldiers, uh, young mothers, uh, really healthy people. Uh, and the, the argument for this basically from epidemiologists is a so-called cytosine storm, a storm in the lungs. The healthy immune systems were over responding to the virus, to influenza, H1N1, um, and that uh, quite likely the older demographic, the older generation had been exposed to something closer. Um, so in any case, one of the ways that I like to start, and if you ever heard me um, talk about this, you know, uh, Victor Vaughn, who was the uh, dean of uh, the University of Michigan's Medical College, becomes the head of the U.S. Army's Surgeon Corps, uh, Army Surgeon General, goes to Camp Devens in Massachusetts. He's been involved in infectious disease control for most of his career. He's really been concerned with these questions. He gets there and he sees something fundamentally different from anything he's seen before. And he's pretty devastated, as he notes in his me memories and his memories. Um, they're placed on the cots until every bed is full and yet others crowd in. The faces soon wear a bluish cast. A distressing cough brings up this bloodstained sputum and in the morning the dead bodies are stacked about the morgue like cordwood. This is what we were so worried about in March and April, that this could happen if U.S. Uh, and worldwide um, health systems were overwhelmed. That's what the, all the talk about flattening the curve was about. Uh, and continues to be about. And here's another example of this. I think it's really important to understand that the medical profession itself was astonished by, by how virulent this form of the flu was. So the flu comes back across the Atlantic, comes into Massachusetts, it comes into US camps while the war is still raging. Here's a Johns Hopkins uh, physician scientist who's then a Lieutenant Colonel uh, William Henry Welch. Um, when the chest was opened, this is an account of him uh, doing this work. When the chest was opened and the blue swollen lungs were removed and opened and Dr. Welch saw the wet foamy surfaces, surfaces with real con consolidation, he turned and said, this must be some new kind of infection or plague. And he was quite excited and obviously very nervous. And it was not surprising that the rest of us were disturbed, but it shocked me to find that the situation momentarily, momentarily at least, was too much even for Dr. Welch. And this is an assistant there with him. Um, thinking about this. And again, so these are medical doctors working in the army, seeing the overwhelmed um, hospitals at, at uh, their US military uh, camps. Uh, and remember, this is fall 1918, US troops are going back and forth across the Atlantic, bringing this virulent form of the flu back and forth. And these camps, often very close to or located uh, basically within major city centers, were, were the locus, were the uh, major vectors of transmission in the US, getting immediately into, or rapidly into civilian populations. All right, so let me give you the, a very a brief march through what happened uh, in, in uh, 1918, uh, how it began, uh, and then think together with you all about some further lessons from this moment. All right, so the consensus, generally speaking, is that um, the, the virulent form of H1N1 that we know of um, as the Spanish flu, so-called, uh, from this era, uh, emerged in Kansas, in a county in Kansas, uh, in March 1918. Um, now, there's some dispute and there's some discussion of a comparable flu uh, that appears on the French, on the Western Front in 1916 or 17. Uh, some uh, other origin myths uh, and possibilities related to China, some vectors of transmission through Canada uh, and Chinese laborers, wartime laborers elsewhere. Um, but a useful way of thinking about this and a way you can track this through the data uh, is through American military uh, 
uh, trans transmissions, troop uh, movements, uh, transports of goods uh, from Kansas uh, through uh, the East Coast to Europe and then rebounding back across. So, you know, here's one example. This is John Barry, the historian who, who wrote a brilliant book, I highly recommend, uh, on the flu pandemic, uh, that, that a soldier recalled that of the 12 men who slept in his bunk, um, seven were um, put up uh, ill at one time in March 1918. Uh, and it overwhelmed something like 24 of the 36 major U.S. military facilities in the U.S. in spring 1918, this first, um, first uh, wave of the flu. Uh, now, 1914, of course, was a lot like our present moment. And this is why historians and foreign relations scholars, public health scholars, um, have looked back to the significant amount of data we have from the World War I era, from particularly uh, mil military bureaucracies to understand uh, the globalized world that, that helped to exacerbate the transmission of influenza in, 19, um, in 1918 and 19. Uh, we can watch it happen through records through uh, who's hospitalized, hospitalization records in military uh, facilities. We can, we can look at different um, troop mobilizations, how many people are out of service, uh, unable um, uh, or un, uh, incapacitated from the ability to fight, for instance, on the Western Front and elsewhere. Um, and historians like Emily Rosenberg, Eric Rauchway, and others have really demonstrated quite convincingly that the world was fundamentally globalized by 1914. So by the summer in which World War I breaks out, um, you really see kind of global transmission of peoples, goods, ideas, and viruses. Uh, and that's why it's so similar to the world we live in today. Uh, here's an example of people crowding, uh, again, uh, not um, unfortunately too much like our present world. A wartime workers from the munitions, munitions building in DC, there you see the Washington Monument behind, uh, being served hot chocolate in, in fall 1918. This is when they should have known to be wearing masks and be socially distant, but they're not. And it seems really clear that these kinds of crowds were vectors of disease and transmission, right, obviously. Uh, but you see this in all the wartime states. You see this in, in non-combatant countries as well at this point. Uh, you see this, uh, that the flu goes all the, right, all the way around the world from March, in Can March 1918 in Kansas uh, to, um, to Algeria uh, and in, in June, uh, to, to New Zealand uh, in June, July. Uh, Australia was able to hold uh, at bay for some period of time, but, but, but by 1919, Australia has also seen a wide, wide outbreaks and they're using the same techniques. So here's a quarantine camp. One of the things that historians and public health scholars uh, always point out is that we today in 2020 are using early 20th century techniques to combat this pandemic. We, sure, we have a more modern um, medical health infrastructure. Sure, we have you know, uh, more capacity to treat disease. But at the end of the day, the main techniques we have to, to uh, deal with it are very similar to those of 1918 and 19. Their closure policies, their social distancing, their masks, hand hygiene, uh, and they're uh, ultimately about collective action and individual agency. That individuals have a lot of agency to um, help uh, prevent spread in their communities or to act with disregard for others and enhance spread. Um, the war uh, of World War I is really the way to understand uh, how the disease uh, spread so fully and, and massively around the world. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about this, but induction camps are, are, um, and training facilities, and then the close proximity of troops on the front. Here you see French forces near the Western Front, US troops at an induction camp in Syracuse. Um, these are obviously uh, the kinds of places where social distancing is very hard, where young healthy people who are especially susceptible to the virus uh, were likely to um, be able to spread it from one to another. Uh, these are also places that recorded that very well. And so we have, again, very good data about uh, rates of transmission, fatality rates, um, and how things change over time. And that's a very important piece of this. Another piece of this that's really important, and I think a further lesson for us to think about that we weren't thinking enough about in March or April, um, is the ways in which patriotism uh, can operate to either slow down information about uh, d death and disease and spread, or uh, can help to generate the kind of positive collective action that can prevent that. Uh, so here's an image from the Red Cross. If I fail, he dies. This is about war work, but it's also about, as you see there, making masks, preventing spread. Right, Red Cross volunteers making gauze masks in the fight against the Spanish flu, making gauze masks um, to prevent spread in their communities. Um, 
And these are volunteers who, again, are in that healthy demographic range, most likely to be affected, in fact. And so they're taking that on themselves uh, with, with a full awareness of that. One of the things that we saw in 1918 and 19 was this language of slackers being applied um, to those who, who didn't show up for the draft, for instance. In the US, there were draft slackers, so-called. Uh, and this was a very important kind of martial rhetoric, this language of war being mustered against those who weren't doing their patriotic duty to join in the war effort. This language then gets adapted in fall, uh, in, uh, in fall into winter 1918 uh, for the concept of mask slackers. You see this especially in the West Coast and in California, mask slackers, people not wearing their masks when mandated to wear masks. Um, uh, newspapers were reporting on this and uh, Red Cross and other agencies were suggesting that uh, a patriotic effort to stop the spread uh, was your duty. Otherwise, you were a slacker citizen, a slacker human being in this society. Uh, that was something, a language that you might have expected could have been imported into public health messaging uh, in 2020, uh, and thus far has not been. Uh, in the US at least. Uh, so another way to think about this moment and information is to think about World War I. Uh, in, in the UK, there was something called the Defense of the Realm Act in 1914. Uh, this prevented communicating anything that would undermine the war effort. Uh, very similar uh, actions were taken in the US. The Espionage and Sedition Acts in 1917 and 1918 were thought of and, and uh, generated uh, to prevent and punish enemy agents, enemy action, espionage. But the way they were operationalized was often to prevent the press from reporting information about, say, the combat effectiveness of US troops who were sick with uh, influenza, uh, or um, to uh, enact or, or spread something that might generate panic. This is something we've heard about in some of the politics in the US in September 2020, about whether or not it's better for a president or administration to minimize a threat or not. And I would note here, Woodrow Wilson in 1918, 1919, never once publicly spoke about the influenza pandemic, never once publicly issued a statement on it. Um, though the Surgeon General, Rupert Blue, uh, did issue orders, they came late, and uh, the Surgeon General's office uh, minimized the threat of the flu, uh, calling it a three-day fever, uh, something, uh, the grip, uh, or an old disease by a new name. Uh, and trying to say that precautions were all that needed to be taken in the context of the war, that the war was the most important thing. So Woodrow Wilson, the Wilson administration were focused primarily on the war, uh, which meant that things like the espionage and sedition bills, they um, prevented more honest, rapid uh, communication of information about the influenza pandemic. Uh, and you could argue they then also prevented a core central federal effort related to this response because the war was the main federal effort and there all everything else paled in comparison. What stands out then in comparison now, six pl months plus into 2020, is that the US federal government has not uh, had an ex another external threat as significant as say a world war, um, but has, has uh, been you know, somewhat comparably uh, lacking in you know, a singular, solitary, coherent message um, in, the, in the form that you might suggest or want uh, to have seen uh, in light of modern medical knowledge. And again, we can talk about this in Q&A as a comparison point. Uh, so here's another example. If you think about war propaganda and, and, and the kinds of ways that people were being conditioned um, to not talk, uh, you know, keep, uh, don't talk, the web is spun for you with invisible threads. And so one of the pieces here that's worth taking into account is, of course, the sense that it would undermine the war effort if the reality of the viruses spread in the US were, were better known. Uh, and one of the really sort of abysmal, maybe you want to say shameful even, elements of this story is that the Wilson administration, Woodrow Wilson knows that in September and October when the deadly a second wave of influenza is coming into the US, is fully aware that US troops uh, and US um, auxiliaries going to Europe, nurses and others, uh, are bringing um, the virus back and forth, are bringing um, what they would have called the germ uh, back and forth. Um, and yet the US does not stop or slow its troop, troop transports and material transports. The war effort was the singular focus. Um, and one interesting way to think about this and tragic way to think about this is as troop transports arrive, say in Brest in um, France uh, in, in summer and fall 1918, uh, they're met by ambulances and hearses uh, to take off the dead who died of the virus uh, or who are uh, very sick crossing the Atlantic. Um, that's how bad it was in, in that period. And the same is true 
when troop transports come back to the U.S. Uh, in later in fall 1918, they're being met uh, and quarantined, in fact, uh, because of the fear of more viral spread. Um, so here's an example of that, which I just said. Uh, Spanish influenza, a new name for an old familiar disease. And this comes from, you know, things that are being put forward by a Red Cross. This is the information you're getting from um, the Surgeon General, uh, that this runs nationwide as late as late October 1918, when this, when the most virulent, uh, deadly wave is out there, you know, um, is indicative of the ways in which uh, the federal government and other actors uh, at, at the state and local levels were often minimizing um, concerns about uh, this. You know, and here you see very similar language to stuff we've heard in 2020. You know, the symptoms aren't that bad. Many people, you know, if you take proper precautions, won't be affected. Uh, it, it, you know, no occasion for panic, as you see there in another headline. Um, uh, very low percentage of fatalities. You know, if you're living in a city like Philadelphia in late October 1918, um, this does not uh, accord with your lived experience. Uh, Philadelphia has a major uh, outbreak um, in that period, and, and they've seen bodies pile up on the corners by that point. They are very worried. And so you're in seeing this disjuncture between kind of official rhetoric and language and information and the lived experience of people suffering with the flu. It's another important takeaway point that historians have, have uh, and public health scholars have emphasized. And it seems all the more relevant today, you know, as we've seen back and forth issues, say, related to masks and other behaviors and practices, um, or even opening. Uh, indoor operations for different kinds of facilities. Um, this disjuncture between what's officially said, what, what we live with as our experience, and then what seems to be anecdotally true um, uh, in terms of health and safety is another piece of this story. Um, and I would add, there's a great example in this article that I recently did with some other scholars. Uh, in, you can find in literature, um, the ways in which this is operationalized in your everyday life. And this is an important takeaway, it's so-called contagion guilt that you know you took a risk you went to a wedding or you went into the office and you saw someone or, or there might have been a transmission and then someone in your your immediate network say someone you love deeply gets the virus um, this contagion guilt and living with the fear of contagion guilt uh, is something that scholars find in the works of virginia wolf and, uh, other modernist writers in the 1920s into the 1930s, for instance. Um, and you, so you see this in literature, you see this uh, in, in other examples uh, of um, popular culture uh, in, in the period after the influenza. And this is something we didn't think much about when this broke out, uh, although, although many people were taking personal responsibility. And that's a big part of the suffering story of 1918 in social history. All right, so why the Spanish flu? I want to give you a couple uh, big picture takeaways and then uh, we'll get into some Q&A as well. All right, why the Spanish flu? Well, many of you have probably heard this and know this. I set this up already, right? The US and the British press, the French press, the German press are all censored because of World War I. So only nations that are neutral in that period, like Spain, um, had press uh, that was publishing uh, more uh, honest and accurate information, particularly related to viral spread, uh, because they weren't as concerned with whether or not their troops uh, would be uh, combat capable, for instance, um, or, or other reasons uh, for, for minimizing risks. So when King Alfonso XIII comes down with a very bad case of the flu in May 1918, uh, and a number of other uh, members of this aristocracy and prom prominent people in society, the Spanish press writes some really sensational accounts uh, of what was going on. People were dropping dead in the streets, um, that they were dying very fast, very healthy young people were, were getting sick, um, and talking about other ways to deal with, with these concerns. And then you, you rapidly see, and you can Google this to see some of the accounts, um, there are scans of, of a lot of the, this press coverage. Uh, in the Ang first in the British, the Anglo-American press, um, pick this up and they say uh, that the Spanish flu, uh, that this is a Spanish flu, it's a Spanish problem, uh, and it comes from the, um, from the environment or the climate uh, and the social practices or mores of, of the Spanish, that they're dirtier, that their environment breeds viruses. And you see this in uh, what's being discussed, in part because there was a perception by the British and the Americans that the Spanish were tacitly uh, more on the side of the Habsburg Empire, of the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans in the war. And so they were uh, more of an enemy nation. Uh, and therefore, this sort of kind of racialized, politicized rhetoric was what the US uh, and the British uh, kind of weaponized against the Spanish. Now, one thing that's interesting in this moment is the Spanish actually call it the French flu. Uh, 
because they blame the flu coming from the front and coming from workers going to and from Spain doing war work. Uh, 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 and similarly, the Germans call it the Russian pest. Uh, and you see other nations operationalizing and weaponizing uh, the virus in a very recognizable way uh, to what we've seen, particularly out of the Trump administration, the China virus, the Wuhan virus, this sort of thing, right? Uh, and that this language shouldn't surprise us that it happened in a global uh, context, in the context of a war. Um, but, you know, what's an what's important element here uh, is that these international dimensions were crucial to understanding the context, the flow, uh, and the information coming out in that era. So, you know, uh, a little bit later, so what happens with this second more, more deadly virus? So in the spring of 1918, um, the British uh, fleet, for instance, has 10,000 or so sailors get sick, but only about a handful die. Um, the, you know, a number, as I said, something like 24 out of 36 US military bases have, have uh, full medical wards of people with the flu in the spring of 1918. But they're not dying in those large numbers, the numbers that we associate with this deadly second wave. Um, but by uh, late summer, you start to see uh, this coming on. Uh, you see um, in, uh, particularly in places that the British and American observers think have good, modern, healthy, medical care who are less like the Spanish in this pejorative sense and more like uh, Anglo-Saxons uh, in this uh, positive superior sense of the time. Uh, it, the, when the Swiss start to suffer really disproportionately, have large numbers of their military posts, for instance, out of combat effectiveness, uh, having um, <clears throat> their uh, medical wards filled up, uh, what, what you see, what we can see in the, uh, for instance, US Naval Intelligence um, officers writing back uh, they say things like, um, in, in a report stamped secret and confidential, um, the disease now epidemic throughout Switzerland is what's commonly known as the Black Plague, although it is designated as the Spanish sickness. Uh, and they worry, the British and American intelligence officers worry that this deadly second wave is now going to really hit the front uh, and make their military op operations um, much more difficult, as with the coming fall they're hoping for uh, the pivotal stages of the war to happen and the war to conclude, right? And American troops have been mobilizing slowly. They're finally on the front. They're finally involved in U.S. Um, weapons. Uh, material aid has, has really begun to make the difference in the conflict. And so we can see in, in these reports um, the global spread in the, in the second wave. Uh, one of the big takeaways, if you've been following this, uh, from this moment is that, you know, the city of Philadelphia, for instance, has a huge Liberty Loan Parade, September 28th, 1918. Um, they're told by public health officials to not do it. This becomes what we now think of as a super spreader event, uh, like indoor political rallies, potentially, or like, uh, or like football games, potentially could be. This is the fear that we have now, uh, looking back on this moment, um, you know, at its worst, then Philadelphia gets ravaged because of this. It's the biggest parade in Philadelphia history to that point. Um, there were warnings to not uh, move forward with this. There were already cases of flu in the area, and they, they moved forward with the, uh, with the parade. Uh, as a result, you know, you have immense suffering and human tragedy. In some families, there are none left to take care of burying their dead, and others are unable to bury them or cannot get undertakers, you know, husbands, infants dying. Um, there's an account uh, from Texas um, that, that I find really searing a, a family of 10. The husband keeps going into work, works all day, comes home, takes care of the wife and uh, all the kids. Then he gets the flu. Now there's no one to work and there's no one to take care of the whole family. Uh, and you see this again and again in the social history. And this is what we were so worried about potentially happening in the US if the healthcare infrastructure was overwhelmed. But you also saw pushback. And this is a really important element um, and, a, and a further consideration for us today. I think, you know, in studies of the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 19, uh, generally speaking, the pushback has been something um, that historians have, have not played up because it wasn't as widespread. Um, but disinformation and misinformation were a big part of the era, uh, as were kind of uh, individual incentives and group incentives. So you saw pushback against, for instance, um, closures of certain kinds of industries, whether they were uh, amusements, uh, restaurants, billiard halls in that era, or, uh, or religious uh, ceremonies and services. You saw pushback in, in that. 
those groups wanted exemptions or they wanted to carry on as normal or make modest changes, say 30 minute outdoor mass instead of indoor, things like that. Um, but you also saw a lot of folks making claims, um, like you see here, the public should be educated that the disease isn't as deadly. You had doctors giving different information. You had medical professionals suggesting, you know, spitting was the problem, but you don't necessarily need masks. Um, uh, and you saw newspapers uh, with competing perspectives and in, in very much akin to what we saw uh, roughly in May and June in the US of 2020, the argument uh, making a kind of facile binary between health and safety on the one hand and the economy on the other. Uh, here you see the editors of Philadelphia Inquirer <clears throat> making a case that strict closure orders were too much. Um, they go too far and they urge regular life, work, rest, exercise with precautions and not closures. Uh, now, living in the city of Philadelphia, where at one point 700 people were dying a day, and that the uh, clergy members who were driving the uh, horse carts to pick up bodies were overwhelmed, that literally bodies were on the streets in this era. Um, they did not uh, you know, necessarily see it that way in, in tenement communities and other communities. Um, uh, but uh, this argument you can see replicated in the press uh, in lots of major cities across the US in, this, in, in 1918 and 19. Another thing that I'm often asked, another thing to reflect on is about uh, the economy. And we can talk more about this in Q&A as well. Uh, you know, here's a Wall Street Journal piece from October 1918. In some parts of the country, uh, the pandemic has caused a decrease in production of approximately 50%. Uh, and almost everywhere it's occasioned more or less of a fall, you know, loss of trade, loss of retail. Um, these have all been noticeable. So economic historians have looked at this and they, they argue pretty consistently um, that once you get up back on the other side, these are really largely short-term effects. There were some um, cyclical problems in the American economy in the early 20s. We often think of it as the roaring 20s, but of course, there were problems in terms of inequality and there were problems of readjustment and of inflation uh, after the war, for instance. Um, but there were uh, significant issues during the pandemic uh, with, with a, a short term tail. And, and this again comes back to something that I said, which is a further insight from 1918 for today, that there really is no such thing as business as usual. Just because businesses were open doesn't mean people will show up. It doesn't mean that everyone is sick. It just means that they're making their own risk calculations about what is more reasonable uh, given what they know. Uh, and the more fear or lack of knowledge, and we saw this in 1918, uh, the more likely those risk calculations um, vary significantly. We can, we can talk more about that too. Here's another example of, of a healthy person um, suffering in this moment and also sort of the stages of this process. So uh, a family, the O'Briens, uh, Phil O'Brien is a sergeant stationed in France and his sister, Sis O'Brien is working at Gonzaga as a nurse. So this is Spokane, Washington. Uh, his father writes this letter to him abroad that his sister started caring for the sick and pretty rapidly died. Um, that she volunteered to treat the flu and veterans as they were coming back. Uh, she was a wonderful, amazing person and he's sending this abroad just as the son uh, is going um, to uh, the front again. Uh, and, you know, as it notes there, uh, that, that her death brought the first golden star to our family banner. Now, the reason I emphasize this is back to that martial language and rhetoric. One thing we have not seen in the US is a leveraging, a significant leveraging of martial language to defeat the virus in, in the way that you saw go all the way down to these individual letters, this sort of letter to a child on the front after uh, his sister died. Um, the, the, a gold star family member, uh, she did it like the soldier she was, is the literal language there, you can see it for yourself, um, is a really important way to understand one possible path in terms of political rhetoric. Uh, now, there are costs of, of making something seem martial, of course, and we could talk about that too. Right, I want to just jump through a few more bits and pieces here. Uh, you know, you've probably seen these iconic images, but one reason you see so many women uh, as part of the 1918 response is that many men were in the many medical male professionals uh, were in the armed forces at this point. And so disproportionately, you saw uh, medical staff uh, and women, nurses in particular, affected in that era. Um, and again, in the first wave and in, in or the first moments of the pandemic, we were seeing this with, in terms of uh, lack of PPE and medical professionals getting the virus, say in places like New York and Seattle. Uh, we've seen uh, that continue. Uh, and one argument for that is that there's more viral load in the patients who these medical professionals are seeing. And even though we have much more uh, capacity with PPE today than they ever did in 1918 and 19, still medical professionals are on the front line, like that nurse that we just saw. Um, 
here's a way to think about the spread across the country. Uh, public health reports uh, in December, uh, you can see how it spreads from east to west, uh, moving slowly uh, from uh, before September 14th up through October of 1918. This is that deadly second wave again. Um, and uh, one other thing to note here is that the virus lessened in strength moving across the country, or that's how uh, people generally speak about it to some extent, that it seemed more virulent in, in that September, October period on the East Coast and the West Coast. And there are a number of theories about this. And there are also a number of different states that are affected differently. Pennsylvania, Colorado, Maryland have very high mortality rates, but are not states that are very comparable otherwise. And so that's another uh, piece of the puzzle that we'll be figuring out after 2020, just like we've been trying to figure out um, from the 1918 data. I could get into that more if you want to. One uh, more set of things, and then I'll try to wrap up. So non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, that's what we call closure policies, hand hygiene, all that sort of stuff. What can we learn from that period that we can apply today, even in a second wave? Well, we know about uh, flattening the curve uh, in the city of St. Louis. There was a public health official whose father uh, was a uh, union uh, surgeon who had been, always been interested in uh, infectious disease. Uh, he was empowered by the local mayor to put on more strict closure, social distancing. Uh, and St. Louis does a lot better. It doesn't stop its suffering uh, and overall death. It suffers plenty, but unlike Philadelphia that held that parade, that had that super spreader event, uh, it didn't suffer nearly as much, didn't overwhelm its health infrastructure. Uh, same sort of thing if you think about excess mortality, that is more people dying than they normally would in a given place, a comparison between Philadelphia responding poorly and St. Louis responding well. Um, some other examples of this, uh, places like Denver, uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh had a phased closure policy, so their parochial schools stayed open a little longer than their public schools um, in 1918 in the fall. Uh, because of the lobby of the Catholic Church and parochial schools, that phased closure uh, led to this uh, uh, slower but higher uh, peak uh, is, is what uh, public health scholars generally talk about. Um, so phased closure is not a good idea. The, the thing that we learned from 1918 that we should continue to apply today is when you close, you close in full like a door slamming shut. An uh, example of Denver is a good one here. Um, I've talked about this before, you may have read about it. Give you the short take of the amusements industry, the amusements lobby, as the as data and disease seem to indicate it's declining, but not uh, a low enough threshold, they start to reopen. Uh, then on November 11th, uh, you get Armistice Day, and boom, you see another peak, you see another um, set of death and disease happening, uh, and they did not have a, a um, a reopening policy that was led primarily by a death and disease and data, but rather by, um, by wishful thinking, by special interests and others, uh, then they wind up celebrating. Uh, people just pour out into the streets and celebrate uh, the end of the war, uh, and you have another um, increase. And this is a, a, certainly a fear that we have for a second wave in the US today. All right, uh, let me leap through a few more things. I have lots of great images. This is an era that has so many fantastic images. You know, thinking about how to avoid this so-called Spanish flu. This does this sound familiar? This is from the British press. You know, avoid crowded streets. Don't go on the buses. Don't get too tired. Don't take a taxi. You know, don't, don't speak to other people. You know, people didn't know very much about how the spread was happening then. Uh, there's some really amazing accounts of how people were fearful. Healthy people not leaving their homes, not helping their neighbors. You know, this. Uh, has thankfully has not been a, something we've seen a lot in the US or around the world thus far, uh, but we have seen this kind of misinformation or lack of information. Um, one thing that I've been asked a lot about that seems a lot more relevant now than it did before, we were hoping we would, could possibly have normal elections in the US was what happened in 1918. Well, yes, they held elections in 1918. There were midterm elections. Woodrow Wilson was running on the war, which was uh, drawing to a close, but hadn't yet been completed. He wanted it to be a referendum on the war. Uh, wear a mask when voting, you see there, uh, you know, uh, some battles between which parts of society should be open first or closed first, saloons versus churches. Some polls didn't open. Uh, basic takeaway here, you saw a decline of about 20% in voter turnout. Uh, it was a rebuke of Wilson's Democratic Party. Uh, the, the Republicans get about 25 seats in the House and another four or five in the Senate. They take control. And then in 1920, uh, the opposition party, the Republicans, also get the White House. Uh, they run on an America First platform, a uh, platform of moving towards normalcy. 
after the pandemic, after the war. This is uh, Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge. Uh, and um, they ride into power, pushing back against Democrats' uh, arguments about how the war was fought. Um, and pushing back in this era also took the form of the Anti-Mask League uh, that you all have probably heard about in California um, uh, that uh, made an argument that's very remarkable today that li their liberty and civil liberties were at stake and the utility or effectiveness of masks was in question. Uh, and there, in states and cities, particularly cities that had ma mandatory mask mandates, you saw some battles over this. But there was only one large organized organization like this in San Francisco, the Anti-Mask League. In most places, there was not widespread anti-mask um, activities. There were some in Portland, Oregon, for instance. Um, there was pushback, uh, but not in this large organized way. And and uh, the other thing to take away and reflect on now is that it, this was not highly partisan. Um, the, these organizations were neither Republican nor Democratic, uh, that, that they uh, were a, a special interest or lobby group, but not highly partisan and not polarized in the way that we've seen since. Here's some more evidence about that mask slackerdom, police actually enforcing this. It's one day in San Francisco, 100 people uh, were arrested, uh, fines were implemented, there were jail sentences as well. Um, it, it, trying to push forward the sort of set of public policy and public health efforts to make people wear masks. Um, and you saw this too in cartoons. Uh, say ma, even the horses are wearing them. This is from Fort Wayne. Um, and trying to educate family members uh, to wear them as much as possible, even indoors, even kissing, even with kids, even you know, in, in all sorts of walks of life that there might be resistance. Um, and this went through the Christmas season in 1918. So here you see people shopping and they're being protected. Uh, and the chief objectors in this cartoon, also from Fort Wayne, uh, are the germs. The germs say, oh man, I thought this would have been great, all these people out shopping for holiday presents, but in fact the masks are stopping that. And again, so you can see how the cartoons, so the po political rhetoric by late in fall 1918 are really developing a, a mass communication related to a public health strategy, even if it's not coming from the Wilson administration. And then economic and political effects, as I spoke about, we don't have great data, but we do know that high mortality and illness really had enormous negative socioeconomic effects. Um, there were decreases in mine output, decreases in businesses, uh, retail sales. Rising xenophobia is another part of this story, and I want to end with that. Rising xenophobia, uh, riots, and conflict also came out of this moment. And so one thing that I worry about, historians worry about, is that the summer after the third wave, so spring 1919, uh, was when we saw large labor upheaval, the so-called Great Steel Strike. Uh, you saw uh, riots, racial violence, uh, African-American GIs coming back from the war uh, were lynched and attacked, uh, demanding their rights, their full citizenship rights. And so that summer, that moment um, was, was really a fraught one in US society. Red Summer expelling immigrants, xenophobia rising. Um, and it's something that should worry us all in thinking about what the dislocations of pandemic and in this case, this location is a pandemic plus war, uh, but for us, it would be the pandemic plus the recession might mean um, towards longer outcomes. And we've seen that in terms of protests and other activities, uh, but where that will go, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Um, some of my main insights are things that I've often described that where there were cancellations and postponements of large events, uh, we really know that these anti-crowding measures worked. Um, they worked to slow the spread, they limited death and disease. Uh, but most Western nations that were involved in the war minimized risk. The US was a, a great example of this through the Committee on Public Information. The US explicitly sought to hide infections and tamp down information. This also happened in, in, um, in England. Um, and this meant that citizens were ill-informed, that, that they didn't know what was going on, that they didn't have good techniques to fight back against viral spread, not rapidly enough, and they didn't trust their leaders. In some cities like St. Louis, they did, but uh, overall, they weren't able to fully trust their leadership, places like Philadelphia, for instance. Um, so honest information is key. It's something that we continue to long for uh, in every nation confronting this. Honest, clear, coherent um, information, layered closures are, are, are not good, as opposed to slamming the door closed, and gradual reopening is a lesson that we learned in 1918 that seems even more important uh, in 2020. Uh, here's a few select references. I know I've gone on. Um, we, we wanted to uh, give you a really full sense of the global dimensions of this moment, 1918-1919, and I will leave it at that and we can continue with some Q&A. Thanks very much for listening and participating.
Oh, that is wonderful. Uh, Chris, this is Tim DeRoche, Director of Programs for World Oregon. Thanks again for such a rich um, perspective. I wanna jump right into questions. Um, we've got a question from Steve, which is what changes to the US public health approach, particularly to the balance between federal, state, and local were made in the wake of the 1918 pandemic and what level of after incident review occurred, whether congressional hearings, ad hoc commission, et cetera? Oh, wow, great question. So one thing that stands out, um, there's a comparison between the US and its neighbor to the north, Canada. So Canada, after the conflict, Canada is very similar to the US uh, in a lot of its responses. But after the conflict, uh, Canada founded its, a Department of Public Health in 1919. Um, and began a, a set of federal policies to figure out how to deal with pandemics. Um, the U.S. in contrast did not. So you did not have major after action reports of the kind you're suggesting would be useful and that we know for sure the CDC will be doing um, in the near future in the U.S. regardless of political administration. Uh, one of the things that my colleague Nancy Bristow, the University of Puget Sound, who wrote um, a great book uh, called American Pandemic argues is that there's a very rapid move towards a kind of amnesia in the US about the costs and consequences of local action um, because there was so much suffering and death, uh, because so many public health officials botched it to some extent, um, that, it, that this kind of amnesia leads to a lack of oversight. So city of Portland is a good example. The city of Portland had too many um, chefs in the kitchen. There were more than four major uh, decision makers in the public health uh, infrastructure. So unlike, say, St. Louis, where there was just one main public health official, uh, and that led to incoherent uh, set of uh, moves in Portland's um, policies, that was not changed immediately following, uh, despite the fact that it was universally known through city council meetings and other things that, that, that the unwieldy infrastructure of public health in the city of Portland was itself a major problem. One of the takeaways, however, that we do see from analysis that comes out is uh, coming from things like the Journal of the American um, Medical Association. So there are uh, quite a few studies in the 1920s by public health professionals, by doctors, of what measures worked and what didn't. Uh, you don't get a, a sense of uh, vir knowledge about viruses until 1935 and the first vaccines against influenza in 1945, roughly. Um, but medical professionals are looking a lot at what I talked about, those non-pharmaceutical interventions and how well they worked, um, what sorts of closure policies uh, are most effective. And at that point, there was some debate over masks. So you can see in the medical literature of the 1920s, um, some debate about the problem of gauze masks that really didn't um, do much. Some of the images you saw there, and I'm sure you've seen about influenza. Um, if you don't have uniformly good masks, is, ma is masking behavior worth it is a question that people were asking in the 1920s. Uh, but you, what again, what you don't see is large scale congressional hearings on this. What you do see in the 1930s is large scale congressional hearings about, for instance, the role of the armaments industry in getting the US into World War I. Uh, the so-called Nye Committee between 1934 and 36. And again, that's part of the reason why I started with those global dimensions. It's very interesting how much World War I overwhelms analysis and understanding of the pandemic, both in the US and around the world. So did the US benefit from experience with uh, earlier historic outbreaks like yellow fever or other diseases in different places in confronting this? Great question. So the history of science literature on this is very conclusive and very clear. A uh, city like New York, which does suffer quite a bit in fall 1918, is far better off because it had waged a 20-year war against tuberculosis, for instance. Uh, that the U.S.'s medical infrastructure, places like the Rockefeller Institute, doing pioneering research uh, on things uh, like yellow fever, um, really were uh, very useful in trying to understand the spread of the germ, uh, those kinds of dissections that I started with, the way American um, medical professionals were worried about um, these concerns. Uh, also policies like quarantine um, uh, had been tried in other places in, 19, uh, in 1889, 90 was the previous uh, largest uh, influenza outbreak. It was very significant and some quarantine policies that had worked then in the late 19th century were, were the kinds of refer direct reference for uh, the behaviors and practices of particularly the, the Army Medical Corps who were trying to keep the virus from getting from bases uh, and naval facilities to uh, civilian populations. So they, they didn't work as well, but they were directly referencing past experience of pandemics to try to apply those techniques 
during during this one in 1918 and 19. So here's a good one, and I I wish we had an hour for you to answer this, but as a historian, what have you noted as the most practical and effective way to decrease or prevent misinformation being spread by elected leaders? Wow. Um, well, you know, uh, one hope that I always have, uh, although it's somewhat forlorn, to be honest, <clears throat> is that uh, the curiosity of those who are interested in getting to know, say, more history uh, will help uh, generate a kind of secondary effects, kind of ripple effects um, to, to know more of the past and not to be persuaded, for instance, as some political rhetoric in March and April suggested that we didn't know anything about past pandemics, viral spread, uh, you know, non-pharmaceutical interventions. We do, in fact, know quite a lot, uh, particularly from U.S. political military infrastructure. In terms of combating these things, you know, I think um, one thing I highly recommend is uh, Tim Snyder's book, On Tyranny. Uh, it's a great, very short book, uh, short read on ways that you can combat kind of top-down hierarchical ways of forcing individuals to conform to other belief patterns, you know, and, and among them is to not agree, um, to not accept received wisdoms. I think this is good, a good position for me as a historian and an educator. I may have my personal opinions, but I need to check them at the door, not agree or assent to information that's given to me or even that just confirms my biases, but try to check them in some fundamental way. So Tim Snyder's argument in On Tyranny is don't, you know, don't um, agree at first. Uh, don't assent to uh, received wisdoms or powerful knowledge coming down to individuals. You know, another, another piece of this question, which is really important in thinking about comparative pandemics, is that, uh, you know, there is a lot of responsibility on local leadership. One lesson there that I, I glossed over rapidly was the real story, I wrote this in a Washington Post editorial and in an Oregonian one, the real story of the 1918 and 19 pandemic is at the local and state level. Those were the officials who communicated better or worse. Those are the officials who citizens and, uh, and engaged members of the community listened to. Uh, if they botched it, they were held accountable often. Uh, and if they didn't, they were esteemed for it. And a big part of that was being honest, even when the answers or, or the situation was terrible, right? Uh, and so I think um, that's an important component of this, that honest, clear communication and action at the local level, you know, uh, a la Tip O'Neill, all politics is local, um, is 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 the is most vital and what i worry most about is misinformation on the local level and so one of the things we saw in 1918 was um i, I moved through the slides pretty rapidly and and the, you know there were some people who thought that the flu might be transmitted through telephones for instance and so they were afraid to talk on telephones there were some there were some people who who um who were so fearful of catching the flu uh, that they wouldn't visit with any neighbors. Um, and, and so that kind of deep, profound misinformation leading to fear and inaction is the kind of thing that we need to combat um, through honest, clear, open communication and through electing uh, politicians and listening to other sources as best we can. Uh, I wish I had a good answer to that. If I did, I would certainly write a book about it. So on the local angle, um... During the progressive era, Portland was a battleground for an anti-vaccination movement. How much of that was influenced by uh, the 1918-1919 pandemic? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a great question. <clears throat> so I don't know if I have all the answers, but I'll give you a few of what I, I know. So um, in 1918, uh, the rap very rapidly, uh, September, October, uh, American doctors on the East Coast pushed rapidly to try to develop vaccines. And in fact, there are a couple of cases that are written about by Ken Davis, uh, by um, uh, Nancy Bristow, by John Barry, by Gina Collada in their books on, on the flu pandemic. Cases where uh, those vaccines were rushed from the East Coast to the West Coast to try, uh, vainly as it turned out, because they weren't effective at all, uh, to stem the tide of the spread on the West Coast. So the ineffectiveness of virtually every um, influenza vaccine, of every influenza vaccine in the 1918-19 moment, um, undoubtedly played a role in how people thought about um, the vaccine, vaccine's uh, effectiveness uh, in terms of other um, diseases, infectious diseases. Uh, the, the, that's the big piece of the 1918-19 story, that, that there was a rush to develop a vaccine. Uh, many different ones were developed. In fact, the army, I think, ordered over 2 million doses to try to get into circulation with, with the troops because they were obviously uh, being hit very hard. 
uh, and yet they were utterly ineffective. That, that the science did not understand how to how to create um, an influenza vaccine for you know for another generation. So um, how much that ineffectiveness overall played into the anti-vax movement of the 1920s um, is an interesting question. I think one thing that uh, scholars of, of language talk about a lot, and this is something you see in the 20s that I emphasize just a little bit, but is worth playing out, is that the, the language and imagery of the virus comes to be used in the xenophobia of the 1920s, 1921 and 1924, the two of the most major immigration restriction acts in US history. Um, and this kind of uh, language of, of uh, pestilence uh, and uh, quarantining at the borders to try to stop um, uh, inferior peoples like viruses coming into the US and breeding in the US. There was this argument in the 20s to end hyphenated Americans. That is, they didn't want Italian Americans or Polish Americans, but everyone should be a full-fledged American. Um, part of that anti-foreignness uh, component was also about the blood. So remember in the 1920s, eugenics is very popular, a uh, belief in um, through good genes, you could produce better people, better citizens, that Anglo-Saxon genes were better. So of course, you know there, there were some really horrendous sterilization campaigns campaigns in the 20s. This was some of the uh, public health measures, notably that, that the Nazi regime looked at uh, in terms of their applications uh, later. Uh, and so this is kind of wrapped up in senses of what might um, destroy the corpus of the nation, destroy the individual corpus of the person, and invading their bloodstream uh, through things like vaccines was part of how people pushed back against that. You know, good genes, good healthy people don't need vaccines was part of that eugenics argument of the 1920s. So I've got a couple of short questions here, and then we're going to have to wrap up because we're going a little over. But in terms of polarization, you just kind of pinpointed that a little bit. What were the different impacts and death rates between urban and rural America in both periods? And what were and are the political impacts and outcomes of this to America's reality? Great question. So I will say there are some limits to our data uh, across the U.S. in 1918 and 19. We have uh, something 70, 80 percent through census records of deaths. Um, uh, we have a good, pretty good sense of exactly where there were deaths um, in the U.S., but we don't know it definitively. Uh, some small uh, towns were hit very hard. Uh, indigenous communities were hit very hard. Uh, this article that I produced, indigenous communities in Mexico, for instance, were hit very hard. Uh, it's in, the articles in the journal, the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. It's on that slide that I said at the end. Um, so urban areas where there were large population gathers, gatherings like Philadelphia were hit very hard. If you look at some of the excess mortality slides, um, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh are at the top of the chart. Um, Boston gets badly hit because of Camp Devens where that I was talking about at the beginning. So where there were, where there were port facilities and major military installations, um, you saw larger transmission in the civilian populations. Um, the, the Midwest is, a, is an odd mix of, of um, fatalities in urban areas, for instance. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we often talk about, uh, scholars of this in the social history, is that smaller communities were more rapidly overwhelmed. So when there was a lot of virus, there's an example in, um, in, in Alaska, a town of 80 people, which was largely comprised, I think, of Aleut Indians, of indigenous folks, um, a town of 80, 72 died. Uh, and when Red Cross officials got there, they couldn't sort out the living from the dead because people uh, were just, um, had just sort of expired in their homes or were unable to feed themselves. There was no one there to take care of them. And there's hundreds of examples like that across the US in the Southwest, for instance, in Arizona, uh, in the Midwest, small towns that were just, or you know, very small communities that were hit incredibly hard. They had no doctor, they had no facilities. And when they were overwhelmed by the virus, and again, remember how fast that incubation period is, just a couple days, it could sweep through a small community and, and incapacitate it very fast. Um, on the other hand, there were communities that, that dodged it almost entirely. And so one of the things you had in terms of the H1N1 is that it, it kept hitting people in the 1920s and thereafter, and there was a fear that it might have changed and become more virulent again. But often uh, that was what you might argue was a second or a third wave, just much delayed hitting communities that were spared and small communities that were spared in that period. Uh, one other thing that we know that scholars point out is that disproportionately people of lower socioeconomic status who had to continue work and lived in more crowded areas uh, or areas where uh, with poor ventilation and, and potentially poor hygiene or, or overall uh, cleanliness, um, uh, and people of color uh, in the U.S. Uh, suffered more and died more. Um, so we, we know that pretty definitively from the statistics of that era. 
uh, just like today. And so I think um, one thing that public health scholars were talking about, you know, in the spring of 2020 was beware the, this differential outcome, um, that eventually it does get to rural communities, but it'll hit urban areas first. I mean, they were right on that. Uh, and that, that socioeconomic status um, and people, marginalized people tend to be hit worse um, by virus, pa viral pandemics in general, uh, irregardless, regardless of the specifics of the virus, right? So the novel coronavirus is different. It affects different systems than influenza. Uh, but the point is more about spread and suffering, not, not the nature of the virus. So that's a great question. So one last question, and then we're going to bring Derek in to uh, take us out. Uh, does the CDC or any federal agency, to your knowledge, ever consult with public historians to understand or frame approaches to pandemics or conflicts that have similarly challenged policy in this country? That's a, uh, I love it. Uh, we should always have uh, consulting historians <laughs> for all these kinds of major public issues um, and uh, political scientists too, um, big tent. But uh, Yes, in fact, you know, if you go to the CDC website even today and you look at their history of pandemics, um, you will find that a lot of what they are recommending as strategies in 2020 come from capsule histories of previous pandemics. And the one that everybody references is 1918 and 19. Um, you know, so you'll find, uh, and this is true in other nations too, the, the major, uh, in the WHO, uh, if you go to the WHO website, there, there's information about the 1918-1919 pandemic. Um, it, it, is, it is very important to look back at this. You've got historians, public health scholars, economists, right, epidemiologists. We, we had a search to go back to find the different, different viruses that had killed different people in each of the waves. So those have been, um, the, the, those genomes have been found. We, we know a lot about the nature of the virulence of, of each wave's virus and how much it may or may not have mutated. Um, so this can be part of that longer sort of history meets history of medicine, epidemiological history, really useful in thinking about then how to how to understand, for instance, what keeps me up at night, which is that we haven't even in the U.S. haven't seen a second wave. These are all peaks and valleys of a first wave. Right. And we're getting closer to that winter season when people will be inside and when there will be the influenza virus itself will also be um, wrapped up in uh, the same kinds of symptoms that you see from COVID. That's when we're likely to see, you know, a second wave or, or worse moment. Um, and that's what uh, public health scholars and historians have been arguing for. And you've heard this from CDC officials. It hasn't been communicated very widely, uh, but the, the fear of the fall season, the winter season is a very real and significant one. And, and around the world, uh, public health officials have been listening to historians about that. Now, what we can do is, is a little different, right? We only know those early 20th century non-pharmaceutical interventions that work. And as I said, individual agency is a huge part of that, that public health infrastructures can only do so much, but it's on us to do it. And one thing that's really fascinating about the, the further lessons, this moment that we're kind of wrapping up was that in the city of Portland, for instance, when in the fall of 1918, they were debating a mask ordinance. Um, and then as they were thinking about how effective that would be moving into the next year. The main lament of the main um, officials in the city was that this was all about individual agency, that if there were any problems, it would be because Portlanders didn't do what they should do, uh, that they didn't take heed of the warnings about not of keeping social distancing, about hand hygiene, about covering their coughs and sneezes. Um, and you know that's the fascinating problematic thing about this. No matter how much we turn to these historical precedents, and this gets back to the misinformation question, um, we need to apply those lessons in the present. And lots of us need to transmit them to others, even skeptics, right? Even mask, you know, slackers, so to speak. Um, and just because the CDC has that information doesn't mean that it's being messaged well, and it doesn't mean that people are taking that individual action. Uh, but, I, but I am hopeful in particular that we know the kinds of techniques that can still stop spread and prevent disease and suffering uh, if we just apply them. Great. Um, Chris, um, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for this. I'm going to turn things over to Derek, who is going to take us home. Great. Thank Thanks, you so Tim. much. Thanks, Chris, for a fantastic uh, presentation, uh, really uh, rooting. And as we all um, hope for our, the current, you know, additional worse, worsening si situation here with the fires and the, the smoke, we'll hope that we get some uh, relief. We just uh, thought it would be good to, uh, you know, look at the under underlying problem that we're still all dealing with, even after this smoke and fires depart, which is the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. And so thank you for um, that historical 
uh, insight and uh, audience for the fantastic questions. Um, again, a huge thanks to, uh, to Chris, to Oregon State University, uh, Oregon Historical Society, and uh, encourage you to support that organization and ours. Uh, upcoming events for World Oregon this Sunday, our young professionals have the Long Reads Club where they take a look at a, a long form journalism article and discuss it. Uh, and then next week we have Mel Gertoff talking about his book on the Trump administration's foreign policy. That's Tuesday at noon. And then Thursday at noon, Peter Lawfer from University of Oregon is uh, talking about a radical proposal he has for um, uh, the immigration situation. And uh, both of them are past presenters that have been very popular with our audiences. So hope you can join us there. Stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, thanks again, Chris, for a fantastic program. Bye-bye.